How you guys doing? Yes? All right. You still with us? Okay, good. Because uh, we still have several hours until the bar opens. <laughs> All right. So that was fascinating. Actually, I was backstage just sort of glued to the glued to the set because I was very engaged and they are very engaging. So I would like to actually now move the story arc along to two companies that are going to share their stories with you. One of the things that I find when I attend conferences is I get a lot of um, top ten things to do or top five things I should think about. But what I actually really need to do is how am I going to get my decision makers to sign off on what it is I need them to do? How am I going to get resources instead of this philosophy of more with less? I need support. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. We have two companies who represent B2B, the B2B space, because I often hear from people in B2B marketing, well, I hear all this stuff about B2C all the time, but how does that apply to B2B? Well, I think you're going to hear some very interesting stories because it's not about business to business anymore. It's ultimately about how businesses are thinking about the ultimate customer. So in many ways, it's B to B to C. So the two folks that we have coming on have actually led transformation within their organization. And as you can imagine, it's not an overnight thing. It's still going. But they're going to give us their reports from the field. So will you please help me welcome Dana Vetter from Aramark and Greg Garrick with 3M. I love that song, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to just start real quick with uh, an introduction of your role, and then Dana will jump to you on that, and then I'll start with the first question. OK. Uh, I'm the social media leader for a global e-transformation team. Uh, global e-transformation, what is that for us? I think a lot of companies, there's a lot of tension between IT, marketing, corporate communications, where you know who has what role, where does it fit? At 3M, we have the global e-transformation team that literally sits in between the center of all three of those. And then, we, of course, we have five big businesses that align around the corporate entity. So we have the luxury of driving change throughout the organization without the constraints of any particular one vehicle. So that's my role within just that team itself. Okay. Dana? Great. So similarly, I sit in a central function inside of the organization. Um, Aramark has eight business units, and there are a couple of functions that run across um, on a horizontal perspective. Um, I sit in one of those groups. It's actually the strategy group, um, and I lead consumer strategy for the organization. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you, but it cuts out every now and then. So if okay. we could make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start with you because you have a title that actually says you're all about changing the organization. <laughs> how did you even get there? And how did your organization recognize that that was a need? Originally, uh, my former director, who's now our vice president of Global E-Transformation, started in a, as a director in our, in our consumer group in the B2C world. And I worked in that, on that team. Um, I think a lot of the way we've been able to drive change in the organization has been around the idea of smaller successes. So we've had a lot of success in the B2C space, and that became recognized as being very applicable to the rest of the company. The rest of the company would come to the B2C world and come to our consumer business, try to learn about these new technologies, learn how to work with these new technologies, mm -hmm. and that need was recognized in the organization in tandem with the transformation that 3M is taking internally as well as this new external world. Right. And Dan, I remember, for those who don't know, Dan and I actually uh, had a, uh, an opportunity to work together at the beginning of this whole transformation process. And Dan was here last year talking about how they were able to get an organization like Aramark uh, to even consider this transformation. I remember some of the early conversations we had <laughs> was this idea of, does Aramark even need this? It, right. It's a company that didn't necessarily have a brand. And you sort of stepped up to the plate. It wasn't in your job description that said that you have to lead transformation. You have to help Aramark get a brand. And you've written a, a series of wonderful articles that tell us about how you got here. But can you kind of give us a quick overview of where we were last year, but also where you're at today? Sure. So <clears throat> last year, I'm trying to think when the date was of that, um, we had just convinced, I would say, or we just garnered buy-in from our most senior executives of the organization. Um, we, we took this all the way up to the CEO. 
And we really positioned it as um, an opportunity for us to not only engage with our core stakeholders, but potentially mitigate some risk. Um, anyone who's familiar with Aramark, we, we don't have, as, as Brian said, we don't go front and center today with the Aramark brand. We're, we're much more of an ingredient brand. Um, but any of you who've been in a hospital, um, you know, been in a college campus, went to a sporting arena, um, we, we provide the food service and the facilities maintenance, and potentially in, in, mo in most of those locations, the uniforms as well. Um, so it, it was a hard, it was hard for uh, my executives to really understand why we needed social. Um, they looked at it as a vehicle where um, either just consumers used it or quite honestly their children or their grandchildren used it and it was just more of a fun thing and it really wasn't going to have stickiness. It had no real true impact to business so why is Dana in my office talking about this? Um, I got a lot of those blank stares. But what we were able to do is we were able to really tie it to business impact and, and business strategy and how we can leverage social and how we can leverage this really change management, which it was a lot of change management, to, to further the organization and to help support our performance objectives. Um, so we met with, <clears throat> excuse me, the most senior executives and laid out a plan. <clears throat> told them that this wasn't a tactical thing for us. We wanted to really lay out a strategy and to um, work with us over the next year um, as we started to lay out that strategy. Right. So we laid out the strategy, a very comprehensive strategy, I must say, and now we're, we're actually implementing it, um, which means that we are working with all of our lines of business to develop what their engagement strategies should be, uh, depending on, and this is very important, depending on what their business strategy and their business goals are. Each of our business units have different engagement strategies. They don't all look the same. Um, and some of them have decided that social is not the right move for them. And, and, and we applaud them for that. Uh, right. Part of our role is to say, what's the risk of not going viral, not, not, look, not going social for this business unit, and, and is there an opportunity to do something differently? Right. Well, actually, I think it's an important question to ask. And it's, it's something that I don't think enough businesses pay attention to, and that is, what is the risk or what is the cost of actually not <coughs> embracing this as a strategy? So you actually believe that at 3M, that social has to be in the heart of the enterprise itself. And so certainly when I talk to companies, that means a couple of things. <laughs> One, it means, well, to be at the heart of the enterprise means we need to have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, or that we need to invest in something like Socialcast or Yammer and have an internal social network. What does that actually mean for you? Well, um, we're doing it in a big, big way. Um, it doesn't get much bigger, I think, than what 3M is putting together. I'm more excited about our internal social program than I am about external right now because of the transformations taking place right now. Mm -hmm. um, I just tweeted out a couple of pictures of some of the things that we're doing. Um, for example, the new collaboration hubs. Um, 3M, when we, when we think about social at 3M, it's external and internal mm -hmm. because one place that many companies fall short is they get these command centers, they get these flashy screens and these dashboards, or they have a, a Twitter account and a Facebook page and a social person that's delivering a report mm -hmm. or on listening metrics or listening information. But by the time it's delivered, it's stale. It's old. The person that gets it doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and explain to me, what, what is this that you're sending me? What, yeah. how, how does this impact my business? Right. So we realized that there are a couple problems we need to tackle. One is when these reports, when this information is available, it needs to be available instantly. And we have 80,000 employees. Everyone needs to see something different. Everyone needs to understand something different. So with our, uh, one of our projects, we are designing a system internally that will draw from feeds and information from a variety of sources to create customizable views that means something to the person that's receiving it. So it's more or less uh, sort of like an internal Hootsuite system type thing mm -hmm. where somebody gets the data that they need to see that's relevant to their job role and they can act on that information as appropriate. And that goes across PR, communications, marketing, research and development. It's a, it's a corporate-wide, company-wide endeavor. Now, part of that is, uh, is also tied into our philosophy now of sharing information. So social for us is a critical tool 
in facilitating the flow of information faster in the company. As information flows faster, we can innovate faster, we can fail faster, and develop better products. Right. So these new collaboration hubs with the multi-touch table systems allow us, back to our collaborative culture that we have right. at 3M, to collaborate around the table, share ideas, and, and flow that throughout the, 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 the world, basically. Right. Because anyone that's in a similar role to myself will see that same information presented to them in a different way. And then the exchange, which is a building that is on campus. It's a 28 foot wide, 35 foot tall interactive screen that we built a building around. The idea that you can fling information onto it, it starts to draw, um, it, it starts to collect the same ideas together and allow teams to collaborate in a new interactive way. So we're taking it from the external and the internal to a physical manifestation of our company, which is critical to the, the long-term growth right. of our program. I, I think it's fascinating. Dana, you've been sort of on a similar journey, but just not with that kind of formal support uh, yeah. around it. And uh, earlier when I said more with less, I, I can't tell you how often I hear that with, within organizations. When I, when I meet with executives, they say, well, we need to look at how we can approach all of this with less. We want to do more, but with less. And Dana, you, you actually took that head on. I mean, you went into to all of the executive offices. You, you actually f kind of, as, as you were mentioning, looked at internal before you looked at external. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of processes to create. You had a lot of people to rally together. Uh, and now you've sort of by default created a group within the group. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what your team now looks like and sure. what it's designed to do today? Sure. Um, when we developed the strategy, the infrastructure strategy, and, and really how to manage social, we decided that a hub and spoke approach was, was right for us. Uh, to your point, we, we weren't really um, given any permission to go hire any new individuals. I actually was able to hire one, um, and then uh, so and he's here with us now, who is, helps us uh, lead digital. Uh, but what we did is we, we created and identified roles in all of our lines of business. Um, who we call social delegates. And all of those social delegates live in the businesses as well as in some of the functional areas. And um, the, the head of social now, Tom, and, and um, one of his other, another gentleman on his team, they host social delegate every six weeks. Um, they work with all of these social delegates um, and really they've developed very robust training. I would say that most of our focus today is around not only creating the uh, playbooks, but the governance. So for a large matrix organization, governance is critical. I had uh, talked to Charlene on Friday and I had said, when we, when we actually looked at the governance, I remember having seven pages put through the RACI model of all of the different aspects of every task that we would have to accomplish and who had responsibility for right. it so that we really had a clear understanding of what our role was and what the line of business roles were. Um, but Tom and his team and the social delegates, there's about 20 of them collectively now, they meet every seven, six weeks to really talk about uh, where the future of social is going, what are the learnings, what are the best practices that are happening in the businesses, and then they also bring somebody from the external in to, to learn new things. Um, as well as we do leverage an internal collaboration um, blog and uh, a posting in a forum as well, and we, we create wikis to create an ongoing glossary, if you will, of new experiences. Um, and then they, we, we joke, um, my team has office hours, if you will. So um, we have an open forum uh, from, uh, on, via phone and then also on, um, on uh, social, internal social site, where we'll answer questions for these social delegates. But to your point, our social delegates, um, they, they, they weren't brought in from the outside. They, they weren't um, folks who grew up in the space and said, I'm a social expert. Um, they were folks who were already part of the business. They were experts in their business. They had a social um, aptitude, which you know we actually asked them to raise their hand and volunteer for this. But since then, um, we actually call them experts now internally because we give them extensive training above and beyond everybody else. Um, we have three levels of training. We have awareness training, which everybody takes in the organization, including the senior executives. We have um, the active level. So these are the community managers and folks that we empower to speak on behalf of Aramark and our clients. And then we have the experts, which are the social delegates um, who actually have to go through the most intensive training. Right. You think about, I don't know if you caught this, but she actually threw out there a racy model. 
So the thing that I find so impressive about that. I have become corporate. I, I used to be in the agency. <laughs> she used to world. be in the I'm agency. So <laughs> <laughs> but I love the idea then that social is throughout, it's permeated throughout the organization, and different people within the organization have different areas of responsibility, whether they're responsible, accountable, whether they need to be informed. You have a very interesting approach to this as well, because in order to, for it to permeate the organization, it actually has to be at some level measurable. So you're working with employees where this sort of becomes part of their evaluated performance? Right. We want to make sure that when, in the long term, that when people are looking at the brands and they're looking at their success of their programs, that they're measured appropriately. Um, I kind of disagree with the previous um, panel in that we don't look at return on effort, return on um, influence, return on fuzzy math or soft metrics. There's a hard, there's a hard number there, and so we want to make sure that when when our plans are drawn up, when our campaigns are put together, those social aspects of the campaigns as they're integrated have to measure back to the objective. Right. So even if it's awareness, that needs to measure back to the objective. So, in terms of employee evaluations, in terms of measuring the success, eventually we're, we hope to get to a point where employees are. Um, accountable for those same ideas and they're not just spending money to spend money on these wonderful ideas that drive no business whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Dana, one of the things that I remember too uh, in working with you is that as you were forming your social delegation, sounds so important, uh, the idea of employee performance had come up, right? Because I, I, I'm sure you've heard it. I, I hear it all the time and that is I already have enough things to do. Right. Um, I don't necessarily need to take this on. How important is it really? Or if you're asking me to do something beyond my normal role, then how am I going to be compensated for this? Or how does this become part of my job description officially? And one of the, the early people, one of the first people you brought into your social delegation was HR. Yeah. So how has that sort of evolved? Well, let's talk a bit about how you brought HR in and then how that's looking today. Well, we brought HR in because um, we have 255,000 employees and they are, we have a decentralized um, organization. So for us, I mean, we're, we're a people business. I mean, we're in the service industry. Everything we do um, centers around our, our people and our employees. So for us, HR was a no-brainer. Um, you know, it was HR, legal, marketing, and IT were really the first four at the table. Um, and when we thought about, you know, it's funny because I lead consumer strategy and, and for us, consumer is probably the last stakeholder, the last constituent that we'll actively be leveraging social for um, because for us, we, we wanted to first think about the employees. Um, and um, when Edelman was up here before, we were talking about the employees and, and it all comes down to your, you know, your brand and who you are and what your values are and that if we didn't really start to leverage our employees and, and train them. Oh, now. Um, and empower them, then we really had no chance at this social you know, business transformation. So we brought HR in. And then uh, to address your, your comment about jobs, um, we took the opposite approach. What we said is that by us training you and by having social as part of your job, it's actually going to make your job easier. Because we looked at the roles that were already doing um, outreach programs, whether it be marketing or HR or, or whomever, and just said, well, now there's a way that we can work smarter um, and that'll actually make your jobs easier, not add something else to your job. So we recrafted their job description to um, look more like a social job description as part of their overall job, whether they're in marketing or communications or HR, um, and then put measurement around how they, they would be measured against that from a performance perspective. Now, with the time that we have left, you both have mentioned business objectives and hard numbers, and I know that you're looking at ROI across the board. How did you both get executive support? So let's start with you. Um, well, on the second quarter earnings call, when the CEO says that your team is a top priority for the company, you just we check that box for support and <laughs> move on. Um, no, I think that that support came over a period of time. We were showing these small successes and showing a business impact mm -hmm. uh, and truly measuring against our objectives. And as we were showing, hey, there is a roadmap here, there is a process where you can measure this and it mm -hmm. can drive business. 
that, that was important. The other thing for 3M is that innovation is critical in, 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 to us. And the idea that we can take consumer insights and bring them closer to the brand is, bar none, the most important thing for us. And it has been since the very beginning of the company. So more than just sentiment, you're, you're looking at bringing, translating those, that activity into insights that are actionable. I, absolutely. Everything needs to be actionable. We want to know and learn everything we can from our customers. In the early days of 3M, we would send our salespeople out to find out this information. Now we have technology that just allows that to happen naturally and enhances what we always have done and want to continue to do to build stronger relationships with our, with our customers. Dan, I, I want to just riff on that a little bit as I turn it over to you, and that is the idea that a lot of, I'm not sure about you, but I can tell you in my experience, one of the things that I often see inside organizations is that social media whether it's a social business initiative or whether it's just in a particular department, usually starts with an idea. And that idea is usually driven around a campaign. Mm. And social then becomes sort of the, um, the product of this idea that has a finite amount of time. But you looked at it differently, kind of as you were mentioning as well. Instead of it being driven by an idea, it's driven by an objective. So you first start with something that I guess translates to the C-suite first and then sort of reverse engineer it. I mean, how did you get there? Yeah. Um the campaign was never our objective. I mean, we're, we're just playing with how do we, what channels do we use now? I mean, we just launched our Facebook uh, corporate page two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I've been, we've been on this journey for 18 months. It was more around, you know, we looked at social being able to enable four, um, four strategic areas. One was demand creation, mm -hmm. um, employee engagement, reputation management, um, and thought leadership. And that's how we sold it into the organization, the C-suite, that um, we knew that they, each one of those four buckets aligned with where we wanted to go as an organization, and that social can help enable um, us to get there quicker. Um, we're also, you know, I wanted to address this, the question um, we're a B to B to C business, and I, and I know that you said that coming in. And for us, what that means is, and, and what really resonated with our executives is that consumers are out there speaking about Aramark experiences, and we have no voice at all. And those consumers influence the, our clients. So I'll give you an example. A school administrator is listening to what a student is saying about their food dining experience. But because we are an ingredient brand and we're not actively um, talking or engaging with those consumers, that then influences the, the, the buyer. So we have two levels of buyers. And we recognize that there's an opportunity to not only engage with the end user to understand how their experience is and how we make their experience better. And that's the number one reason we, we use social from a consumer experience. How do we make your experience better for continuous improvement? But then that impacts clients which is really the, 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 you know, the bread and butter of our business, which is to um, sell more business or you know, attain more business from, a, from an institutional perspective. Excellent. Well, I want to just take a moment to say thank you so much. I mean, if it's one thing that I can take away from this is that before you can engage externally, you have to engage within and build the processes, invest in the technology, and speak the language of the C-suite in order to get to where you want to go. Well, thank you so much for being here and thank sharing you. your stories with us. Thank you. Thank you.